Blog Talk Radio. I stroll through the pictures What I've left behind You want to get I'm locked up in memories They all in a twine The memory is In my mind I know tomorrow Cause that dawn will come You will never know Just what you have done Everyone and welcome to Stop Child Abuse Now, Scan Radio, brought to us by NASCA, the National Association of Adult Survivors of Child Abuse. And we're going to begin the show tonight by reading the mission statement of NASCA. We had a single purpose at NASCA to address issues related to childhood abuse and trauma, including sexual assault, violent or physical abuse, emotional traumas, and neglect. And we do so with only two goals. One, educating the public, especially as related to helping society get over its taboo of discussing childhood sexual abuse, CSA. Presenting facts showing child abuse to be a pandemic worldwide problem that affects everyone. Two, offering hope and healing through numerous paths, providing many services to adult survivors of child abuse and information for anyone interested in the many issues involving prevention, intervention, and recovery. And so this is Stop Child Abuse Now, and on Tuesdays and Thursdays, we have a Q&A call-in discussion with a survivor professional using an open mic for, forum. Um, if you want to call in, I'll give out the phone number for you. The phone number is 646-595-2118. Five nine five two one one eight. Feel free to call in. You can ask questions of Pastor Deborah. You can make comments about what's being said, or you can just talk about something completely different that you need to talk about. So give us a call, please. And now I'm going to introduce Pastor Deborah. She grew up all over the world in a military family where her mother was mentally ill. She is now a survivor professional living in Pensacola, Florida. She's trained in ministry, mental health, working with substance abuse, and is a trauma-informed social worker, all in one. She volunteers with many community organizations. Pastor Deborah says she can minister by text, phone, Skype, in person, and however the Lord directs her 24-7. She teaches that humans have three parts, being of spirit, soul, and the physical body, and believes that all three are important and that each area needs care. We look forward to Pastor Deborah being an active member of the NASCA family for a long time. Okay, and that's my introduction. Hello, Pastor Deborah. Welcome. Hello. This is me. I turn Hello, it over everybody. To you. Oh, I forgot to introduce myself. I'm Annie Margis, sorry. And this is Pastor Deborah. Go ahead. All right, Miss Annie. I'd like to welcome everybody as she did to this uh June the twenty seventh, twenty twenty three broadcast show. 
here on Blog Talk Radio with NASCA. And um, I don't know if there's any callers or not, but I am had been a licensed mental health counselor and now a global spiritual teacher, master teacher, pastor, shepherd, spiritual mother. And so I can talk from both the mental health counseling of how that helps people to heal from sexual abuse, some of the training, some of the national issues, international issues. And I can talk from a spiritual, pastoral, maybe religious uh, way of healing and what both sides look at. So I'm kind of a unique individual that I've had uh, all of that experience and uh, had, had been helping people the Lord's way, as you would call it, spiritual. Uh, for many, many years, probably more than I had with mental health counseling. And so I'm here to answer any questions or talk about any topics that somebody might call in with or have to ask me some questions about. And uh, we don't Annie, have is there any anybody? Callers. Yeah, we don't have any callers on the line yet. Um, I'll give out the phone number then. That's six four six five nine five. Two one one eight. So yeah, no okay. callers yet. All right. What I like to usually talk about is always healing, and because by the time we are adults, typically not always, the child abuse abuse has already ended. We'll say the wounds are there, the destructive uh, behavior and development is there. An adult now is living out of those seeds and those memories and thoughts in their adult life. Typically what happens during a child having abuse, sexual or any kind of others, is there is a lot of disassociation. Uh, some people describe that as disassociating just from their feelings, creating individuals, personalities, people, uh, becoming other things. Uh, anything that would sort of help them escape from what was going on. In the mental health world, that is known as a defense mechanism uh, for the biological brain because the trauma and the fear and the chemicals that are going off during that is just too much for the mind to survive without, say, having causing a heart attack and dying of fright. So the brain... Uh, has a wonderful capability of creating images and thoughts. And so as they think maybe they become a dog or something else, they become a, a boy or they become older, they do a lot of different things, and then that creation goes through the abuse. And you can see that in a lot of movies with Three Faces of Eve and Sybil. You could talk to one part of the personality in a both childhood and adult. And the, your master's level mental health counselors usually do not get that training. And you, you don't really hear about it. And it, if it shows up, it's usually referred to a psychiatrist and then um, to maybe a PhD. And there are a lot of neural psychological testing. They will do a lot of medical testing to make sure you don't have brain tumors or cancer, or something like that, or your uh, all your different uh, chemicals in your body and your hormones, if everything's okay. And um, so I was dealing with a lot of that. Uh, I was exposed to that in my mental health areas. Not most mental health counselors are, but what happens is when you seek counseling, you want to, you need to be aware of that a lot of times one part of you is going to get help with a counselor, but not all parts of you. And uh, so that's one area of mental health counseling that if you're going to seek mental health counseling, you need to explore, be open to. And then, of course, there's always the depression that comes and uh, the anxiety, which is fear, that comes eating disorders come, uh, sexual problems come, and things like that. So a lot of times recovery, healing, okay, can take uh, many years, can take a lot of different techniques and forms from a counselor, 
Some use hypnosis, aromatherapy, some use imagery, uh, some just talk therapy. That's where they just talk about whatever comes up and they flow and um, that kind of thing. And then uh, a lot of people do want to have, we'll say, a religious or spiritual therapist. There's not too many of them. They are now um, some certifications to be a Christian counselor or something else that has, we'll call it, you both have the license in your state to be a mental health counselor or a licensed professional counselor. You've got a lot of medical experience and you have the spirituality part that you can talk from both sides. So healing is real important to people who come to NASCA. Child abuse is always going to be happening. There's always going to be children. It's always going to be happening to. Uh, the courts have known about it for many years. It's always there, the prosecutors, everything like that. And a lot of people such as Pastor Deborah and counselors, we are receivers. We do not usually, but it does happen. We're not the perpetrators uh, that did this to the child. But we have to receive them and we have to start helping them. And a lot of that is not taught even in graduate level, master's level school. And a lot of the books that you read to take your state test, those are more theories uh, from maybe different uh, counseling individuals. One was B.S. Skinner. He believed in behavioral therapy, which means uh, we're going to help you to learn new ways of thinking through pain or pleasure and you because you are more of an animal, and they did a lot of animal research. Then there was Carl Rogers, who believed in just sitting there and letting you talk and express yourself. We used to have to study Freud. He had a lot of wonderful ideas. He did get disproven, but a lot of people don't realize that Freud was, uh, I think he was Jewish, and he was working with women who were having sexual issues. And uh, he was exploring, and so Freud was around for a long, long time trying to figure this out. But I did a wonderful um, video for NASCA's, I think their uh, blog, uh, they have a blog post or something. And it was... um, about the history of treating mental illness. They used to uh, cut little holes at the top of the brain called trepanning, and they believed that bad fumes would get out. They used to treat it by uh, bloodletting because they believed there was bad blood and fumes that you had to let out. And they used to do a lot of horrible things to people in mental institutions because they believed that was what would happen. Uh... There was exorcism, which the Catholic Church calls, but that only happened after they did mental health uh, work, biological, make sure you don't have brain uh, tumor, and that still goes on. It's not talked about. I got most of my spiritual experience early on with the cult, Satanism, witchcraft. I uh, jumped right in with the supernatural spiritual stuff, learned how to do deliverance, which is equal slash exorcism and I saw some things if you had seen them you would think we need to go put you in a straight jacket but I learned that uh, a lot of things and people need healing and there is a mental healing an emotional healing uh, a lot of people say our biological body retains the memories and it does because in the brain it is stored in neurons chemical electrical things Uh, If you study the brain, a great book to understand how the biological brain works in biology. It's called The Three-Pound Universe, excellent book. And you start learning about neurons and chemicals, electrical, and uh, how electricity, how it works in the brain. It's very important to understand that. Not a lot is taught about feelings, emotions, and thoughts to master's level people, but what they realize is that people who come to counseling for whatever, sexual abuse, domestic violence, drug and alcohol, they in the counseling world, we call it, you have some stinking thinking. You're not thinking correctly. You're not thinking 
normally what his society says is norms. And how society defines what normal is, it does change. And what you had to learn is that a mental health counselor, licensed professional counselor, was a part of the medical community. We were very close to psychiatrists, uh, medications, psychiatric hospitals, uh, psychiatric inpatients, uh, the World Health Organizations. We were members of the our respective um, professional associations, both at the national and the state level. And uh, we were trained to realize that people have there's something wrong with their thinking and they can't control their emotions. And they they don't know how to label some things, um, you know. And so you have to also study a, a, a lot of that if you're going to be a therapist, a healer in helping people. And uh, a lot of people, when they go into helping people, they maybe take psychology, social work, mental health counseling, and they get a lot of the, the group therapy and child development and you take classes where a psychiatrist might be teaching you about the the deep in depth psychiatric disorders, the medications and that kind of thing. Very intense. And so when you are a receiver, which means you are to provide healing in, in any form, some of it's life uh what are they called? Life coaches now, um a pastor you have to be knowledgeable. And um, so I have been walking in both worlds. I don't walk in the mental health world anymore. But I have to be able to talk and understand. Um, I've been working with a precious young man, uh, even on the, that comments on videos on the YouTube channel that I have, The Hidden Kingdoms. And he asks a lot about circumcision. And I talk spiritual and he's talking physical and he wants asking questions and he's dealing with issues and he asks a lot of questions and I refer him to a lot of things. He's trying to find what he the answers he's looking for and I have to be you know, I do ministry even on social media. You can do it on LinkedIn, you can do it on Facebook, you can do it, you know, emails, uh you can do it on Zoom. And so when you're trying to help people uh, who have childhood abuse, you've got to be pretty flexible in how you do it now because people are global and they're doing it on the Internet, by phone. Some people do it text and uh, some people, you know, do it in Zoom, teleministry, so to speak. Do we have anybody that's on the line, Annie? We don't yet. Uh, no, but that's I'll okay. give the number again. If you're interested okay. in calling and, and asking a question or making a comment, please do. The number is 646-595-2118. And I will be the guy that answers the phone and greets you. So please feel comfortable to call and be a part of our discussion. Back right. to you, Pastor. Yeah. Okay. One of the things um, that a person who's been, had child abuse. They do need to be doing some looking into their therapist to see what kind of training they have. They can ask the therapist what their specialty is. And um, sometimes you might be in therapy for a long time. There's other avenues to do it. Some people don't do that. Some people just go to group, peer-to-peer. I think, Anna, you told me. You went to peer-to-peer support groups. Nothing wrong with that. Yes. Yes. And usually there's other things, alcohol, maybe food addictions, uh, shopping addictions, um, lottery, like you pay in the lottery or bingo, uh, trying to satisfy, find some peace. So things can be manifesting, but it, but the, the foundation of it is your child abuse that you don't even remember. So a well-trained therapist, uh, you need to ask them questions and get them therapy. And I kind of live from the fact that I was always to help people. 
So I have to stay ready, even if I get a comment, you know, from a video or get a phone call. I had a phone call, I guess, a couple of weeks ago from a lady who got me off of Google about community help, and she was in Albany, Georgia. Uh, she's living in the project. She was high on drugs. She thought I'd be able to give her some money, but that wasn't the purpose. The purpose is she wanted to have some prayer, be spiritually adopted, have a deliverance prayer prayed. And in, in the realm of the spirit, there were a lot of other people on the phone line, and I was used to that. So there were people reaching out to hear if there was a love for them and was there hope. So every phone conversation you have, every time you go to Walmart or you go shopping or you're on your Facebook pages or your statements or your post on LinkedIn or whatever you use, everything should give encouragement that there's hope for healing and there's love out there and you have a future and keep on going on the, you know, walking towards that. Don't stop and just give up, that kind of thing. So DANSP is real good about, you know, helping people to get basic information, lots of articles. I think they have their blog posts, which I made videos of. Uh, They have a lot of guest speakers, and they have a lot of knowledge that can help people. And so when you've been abused, sexually or physically or whatever, you do need to seek help. And even if it's like what Annie did, a peer-to-peer, that's okay. And you might need that and maybe a, a support group somewhere else or just a friend that you can call. And there's a lot of good videos and movies and educational videos that come on YouTube that are free, a lot of life coaches a lot of uh, different ways, you know, and sometimes you need to uh, get your health in order. you got to eat right and you got to exercise and you got to sleep better. And you've got to get other things in your life disciplined and in order. And you have to have a well-trained um, therapist because how it works in when the abuse is occurring, the mind is so wonderful, it will help save and defend itself from the abuse by creating, we'll say, other personalities. Then, as throughout the years, this works all the time. And when you watch the true story, like Three Faces of Eve, uh, with Joanne Woodward, you'll see that as a small child, she had to kiss her dead grandmother. Well, it wasn't sexual abuse, but it was abuse. And her little childhood mind, I don't know, she was three, four, couldn't handle it. Even though her parents didn't mean to hurt her, she split. And um, Eve Black came up and was a rowdy one. And the other one was very tired. But neither one of them were able to uh, hold the body the thoughts, couldn't really take care of a child and couldn't be married to the man that they were. And as healing came and a man stepped into her life who loved her, knew about her problem, the healing started happening and a new personality came up named Jane. The other two died, so to speak, passed on. They weren't needed anymore. So when you understand that as a therapist, that that happens to children and they live their whole lives um, like this. And it was a case of these psychiatrists, they had heard about this, but they had never seen uh, one in real life with multiple personalities. It's now called disassociative identity disorder. It is on the spectrum in the mental health world of post-traumatic stress, and it can be you know, you can have a lot of issues, so you get tested for that. Now, in spiritual work as a pastor, I have to know that that's already there, and I might be talking to many different parts of you. Uh, If I had you in a counseling session, and one part might bring you to the office, while the other parts ain't going to talk. 
and then the one somebody might show up who didn't get abused. And most pastors, you know, it shocked me the first time that I saw this and uh, in a young girl because uh, you're not prepared for it. And um, But then you learn real quick. And um, so it's a uh, healing is possible. It is something that each person needs to strive to go after every day and uh, read books, watch videos. Uh, there's many different ways to do it. I think Bill would tell you, hey, whatever works for you works. And um, so I think he did a lot with AA and stuff. And so what happens is in healing, that should be the goal of everybody who's been abused or is helping somebody who has been abused. And healing is, a, a lot of people say it's a journey. It's a long road. It might be layer by layer, little uh, person by person. The mental health world at the PhD level, they believe if every part that you have recognizes and acknowledges and remembers the abuse, then the whole system has all knowledge of it. It's called being called integration. And now they're happy. Everybody knows about it. And it's not a closed secret anymore, locked behind the door. And um going to go seek healing from a mental health world. They do need to ask the therapist some questions about their training, what they believe, and, you know, that a lot of therapists themselves have been abused and had no therapy. If you are uh, an older an adult and you're going to see a young person, they may not be married, they may have been divorced, may have kids, may not have kids, and they don't have the life experiences that you do. And they may not have the knowledge. They may not have volunteered. Uh, I did a lot in the community. I, I worked with the, the guardian ad litems for two years for abused kids. I was the eyes and ears of a judge. I volunteered with hospice. I worked uh, with aftercare. I worked on crisis, rape, rape crisis helplines. Uh, I was worked as a pastor in a hospital in emergency rooms. So I was around where the receiving stations are. People come to the emergency trying to commit suicide, pumping their stomach out, and I'm standing right there next to the nurses and the doctors and the psychiatrists and the health crisis lines and the peer-to-peer groups and uh, the private practice therapy and the, did a lot of testing and uh, got started with inpatient drug and alcohol with the adolescents. And most therapists don't have that. And they haven't had that, all those experiences to add to their knowledge of helping somebody get healed. And if you've not had those, then they're kind of limited. And, uh, but they, they have, you need to talk to them about their beliefs, about healing. And if you don't remember a lot of times, uh, they'll just see that you're depressed and they'll treat your depression, but they'll never get to the other part. Are there any callers on the line, Miss Annie? Not yet, Pastor Deborah. I'll give the number okay. again, though. Hey, everybody okay. out there, give us a call and, and join the conversation. Our phone number here at Scan Radio is 646-595-211. Do you want to make a comment or say anything, Miss Anna? Oh, gee, do I want to make... No. (laughs) Not at this time, thank you. Okay. Healing is something that uh, Vasca is is always trying to help people find answers, what happened. And probably one of the things is they don't understand why it happened, what, what, who are these kind of people, and why would they do this to children? And um, the therapists really, you know, they don't get that. When you're learning at a master's level, you don't get that deep into that. And there's really not a lot of classes in healing. 
You know, it's more about how do we get you to talk and sort of expose what happened. And, um, you know, it, they, and sort of controlling your biochemistry, like depression, you know, they know there's a balance up. And uh, if you have fear, we can give you some meditation, that, and it controls the hormones, uh, all the that are being released, and you know that kind of thing, which keeps you the heart from beating fast. So healing is real important, and it's it's like I said at the master's level, you get more about. I had to take classes in child development, counseling theories. Psychiatric disorders, um, group therapy. I'm trying to think about it. it was so long ago. And uh, you're a medical person, and you you have to think in a medical framework because when you file your insurance paperwork, who's going to pay you? It's all by numbers, and you send in that you diagnose, diagnose this person on the DSM axis. Uh, and they all have numbers. So you're really a medical person who's diagnosing based on what the patient has told you, and you provide treatment. Where in pastoring, spirituality, uh, uh, it's good if you know that, because some of that is there. But in my case, I have to understand the spiritual part, the supernatural part. What is going on (laughs) that's unseen? And um, what's the culture? A lot of religious cultures, it is okay to do this to children, and it's okay to marry them, and and religious leaders prove of all of this. And um, in uh, a lot of times, young girls, as young as six or eight, will get married, and a legal marriage to an older man, not a teenage boy, they don't have any rights yet. And the man is told, don't come in from the front, come in from the back until puberty happens. So some abuse is religiously sanctioned. And we know from the Catholic Church, and I think lately the Southern Baptist, a lot of uh, youth pastors, you know, they're around young girls all the time, children's pastors, and we know the priests and even nuns can do things. So it's in religion, as we would call it. It's in orphanages, in halfway houses, it's in jails, it's in prisons, it's in juvenile detention centers, babysitters, neighbors, family members, cousins, aunts, uncles, brothers, sisters. And uh, you don't get too much in mental health work what would cause your brother to do this to you, or the babysitter. And I don't really talk about that. They might say the word pervert, okay. But they don't really go into it. In spirituality, as a pastor and a spiritual teacher, I have to know what is going on. Where is this coming from? Uh, Who's behind it? Is this in the biological brain? What would cause a biological brain to do this? What is their brain thinking of this child? Uh, is there something spiritual behind it? And what would be the purpose? So my questions are always a little deeper uh, with a different focus for the same thing that happens in the natural. And um, it is a topic that NASCA is really trying to break the taboo on I'm speaking about it because it's sort of like sex. Everybody knows it happens. Everybody kind of knows how you get pregnant. But nobody wants to talk about it that are sort of normal people. Now, in the adult porn world, uh, they are very visual and they'll show you things. And I work with a lot of children who are in child uh, pornography, you know, in the black market area and stuff. Very normal for them to disassociate and because sex makes money. And uh, we know that prostitutes, you know, um, Make my, and it doesn't matter, boys, girls. It's a sex is a money making thing. Uh, done by the mafias, the gangs. It's um, 
worldwide. And uh, so you have to really be educated if you're going to help people. You have to understand customs, religious customs, history. Why would people do this? Why would adults do this? Why would judges uh, let pornographers off? Um, uh, Why is it accepted? Uh, Why is there a porn industry? Uh, One of the magazines and one of the people that really helped promote this was Playboy, the book magazine, Playboy, Hugh Hefner. And um, it was accepted to see naked women in a very glamorous way. And pornography has been around during the Roman emperors. They had little kids all the time, you know, nothing new. And uh, little slave kids, okay. And um, and nobody in mental health counseling, nobody talks about uh, why is uh, humanity like this? And um, how do they get that way and how do you stop it? So nasc has been real good about providing so many different type of teachers and uh, knowledgeable professionals, life coaches, authors, talk about the subject matter and to bring to highlight, uh, to bring to light all of this. And... uh, it's nothing new. Abusing children, um, doing bad things to them. Children have always been just throwaways and can be cast away. A lot of orphans out there. And then you've got a lot of strange, you know, family members and secrets in the families and you don't talk about it because it would be embarrassing if uncle so-and-so, you know, if everybody found out so they just kind of turn a death they don't look uh and a lot of times fathers are doing it and the mothers know it but they don't want to lose the marriage they don't work uh, they don't want to be attacked so they say nothing they sort of sacrifice their children and um so it is uh, has so many complex issues with it to be healed and a therapist or a pastor or somebody who's going to be the the person helping to heal them has to know all of this and has to be knowledgeable to help. And I have to, like there's sometimes I might be on the phone or talking to a person and I'm dealing with many different personalities in one body. I have a lot of kids. I might have some angry ones. I might have some ones that go to work. I uh, might have some that just suck their thumbs. I have some that are angry, little children. And I have to learn to go with the flow sometimes and um, understand the family system and dynamics that are in there and realize, you know, what's going on. Didn't get that originally in mental health counseling because at the master's level, you don't get that. And the master's level really don't go into psychiatric hospitals. They're not in the emergency rooms with people committing suicide. They're not in there when they're having full-blown psychiatric issues. And uh, I actually volunteered as a pastor um, in our local community, Mental Health Center Lakeview, in the Crisis Stabilization Unit because I had gotten training, volunteered, and I'd go in where they have the locked doors and the people are locked down and the people are in the waiting room been brought there by the police, uh, you know, been Baker acted. And I'm teaching about that we have three parts and that when they get out, they're there temporarily, maybe 10 days, get them on medication, and they get out in the community. And most of your homeless people have been sexually abused. That's part of their problem. And uh, so then throw on drug and alcohol stuff. I had so many experiences that the most normal, we'll say, private practice counselor, even psychologists, did not have. And spent time in psychiatric hospitals and groups and uh, went and stayed, went and visited in a state psychiatric hospital. Okay? I threw myself out there to get experience. I volunteered. 
uh, I got certification so I could be on the sexual assault response team that worked with the military, the hospitals, the nurses, LGBT community, a uh, lot of abuse in that community. Uh, uh, became uh, connected to um, homes up in New York City that would take in uh, abused kids and LGBT kids that are trying to have survival sex. Just to, and And they really think that when they provide that service just to get a bed, they've done a good thing for themselves. And um, a lot of them end up out on the streets, homeless, uh, and whatever they need to do to survive, they'll survive. And you've seen some of the old movies like with Charles Dickens and Oliver Twist over in England. A lot of orphans, you know, through famines and stuff and in the big cities, and, um, you know, they're overlooked. So it's a lot for a person who's going to help bring healing to somebody with child abuse. And they need to study a lot of what happens is going on with the child. And uh, most of your master's level counselors don't get it. And we did used to have to have, I think, 15 hours continuing education every year. We had to have ethics. And um, most of your pastors, youth pastors, children's pastors, they don't get any of this when they go to Bible school. They don't really get a lot about how to deal with this in other cultures and from other religions. And um, we had some occult, I think it was the FDLS, the Mormons out in Texas under Jeffrey's and Texas went after them because they were having 10 and 11-year-old girls get spiritually married to the older men of the church. And, um, you know, that was their spiritual wife, not their legal wife. And so when that child had a baby, then she would collect, uh, the uh, what is it for, if you have unwed mother stuff, because she is not legally married, but she has a child. So she gets food stamps and Medicaid. But that was a, right here in America. A lot of religions do that. Um, if you even study some of early, I think Loretta Lynn, she got married at 14. And so the girls are getting married early as soon as they get into puberty and um, that kind of thing, don't know anything. So there's a lot for a healer, uh, whether it's a pastor, a life coach, uh, to learn and study to bring healing. And sometimes it takes a long time. And uh, God can actually, I learned, he can heal you while you sleep. So there's all sorts of ways. I know people do yoga and they do aromatherapy, the peer-to-peer. They do... um, Individual therapy, group therapy, they read books, they, you know, have all kinds of study groups. And now with social media, they can get a lot of information, a lot of videos on it, and all out out there on social media. Annie, you want to give out the phone number again? Sure. Okay, the phone number is... To call in and be part of our panel and ask questions of Pastor Deborah, or just uh, tell a little bit about your story if you want to. The phone number is 646-595-2118. And I'll answer the phone and welcome you in. Thank you, Miss Annie. You're Uh, welcome. NASCA is very good. Like I said, they provide so many different professionals and topics, a lot to read. They have volunteers that you can call and talk to. I'm a, I used to do that for NASCA. And I get calls, you know, 11, 12 o'clock at night from somebody, usually an older person, but they hadn't been in therapy in years, weren't planning to go and get in therapy. They were just lonely. And I'm a very tough therapist, like a tough mother. Tolerate that. If Okay? It happened a long time ago. You have issues. There's people out there that will help you. 
for self-help groups, for meditation. You don't have to just sit there and live a miserable life. It's sort of um, if somebody has health issues, you can sit there and complain about them and complain about them and poor woe is me, or you can do something about it. And I always, I just didn't put up with the mess. Now, if I'm dealing with somebody that said grew up in hardcore, multi-generational witchcraft and Satanism, heavy-duty abuse that's beyond your understanding, I'll be a little bit more sympathetic. Because they have this stuff that just normal child abuse people have never lived. And it, there's another layer of re- religion and spirituality on top of regular child abuse. So I had to study regular child abuse and spiritual child abuse, occultic child abuse. We'll call it criminal activity, like pornography, human trafficking. I had to understand it from ancient cultures of Rome, Chinese emperors, all over the world, slavery. I just studied. I had to see humanity. I had to see how the church responded. I had to see how humanity and the laws responded. I had to see what men thought. I had to see what women thought. I had to understand. And, of course, I did this, you know, on the side. None of that was taught in master's level. I think that's why a lot of people just really don't get healed. And... um So it's a a, a complex issue, and it might take many years to get fixed, depending on the person, different levels, different areas um, to get fixed and to become, what you'd say, healed, and uh, a lot of work that has to be done, and you need to be with somebody that's knowledgeable. And stick with them. I usually spiritually adopt people. I become their mother. They can uh, come to me. I'm also like a master teacher where I can teach them and they like my disciples. It's but That's what a mother is. She's teaching. She's educating. But as we know, children have to learn. And uh, they have to be tested and tried. So in healing, a lot of people don't believe that that will happen. And usually what happens when you take one step forward, something hits you and you get two steps back. And then you take another step forward and get another, and you get knocked back again. And the spiritual mother said, "Uh uh-uh, I'm right there. I'm going to pick you up. I'm good. We're going to keep walking. We ain't quitting. And they need a lot of encouragement. And now the counselors aren't used to doing that. You know, they see in their office maybe 50 minutes, twice a month. And if it's an emergency, you know, you call 911 and go to the hospital. And so it is a little different. It's a slower process in the mental health world. And a lot of people do need to be on medication. And they need to change their diet. They need to sleep and rest. And um, some of the times the process is very hard on them and um, very tiring. And uh, Sybil was a great movie to watch and how she would get triggered and act. And her mother did the, her mother did it. And the doctor knew about it, but nobody would talk. They were religious people. Some say Sybil's not a true story. Um, other people say it is. I've read other stories about abuse. I had to get into the graphic stuff because I had to know what happened, okay, what it was like. I had to know. I had to be able to. And then when somebody comes to me, whether they're in Walmart or on social media, I don't ask them questions. I don't have them tell their story. I already know it. My job is, I'm not here to have you relive your abuse. I already know what happened. And what I want to know, God will tell me. That's the pastor's side. 
and then he'll tell me how to help you. And so I didn't, don't ask anybody to tell their stories because they're just reliving the pain. And this one psychiatrist years ago, he's dead now. He wouldn't even hypnotize people so they could have recovered memories and they could relive all the abuse. He said, that's just raping them again. And he wouldn't do it. He wouldn't do that to them. But there's some therapists that they love to do that. They actually like to hear that stuff. And they're taught and they believe that by having you relive that. And some of them say, oh, well, gee, we'll we'll have you remember it and have you see Jesus standing next to you. And so he's there with you while you're going through it. There's some therapists that do it that way. So you don't feel so, that part doesn't feel so alone. Jesus was there. But they have you relive it. I never did that. Because they were seeking healing, not reliving their stuff. But I had this one precious, precious young girl. She's my spiritual name, Amanda. She was a spiritual high princess due to be a queen in a occultic family called the Black Land, which is no longer existent. She used to write me letters. I have them. And she would tell me part of what the abuse was about. And she would describe it. And usually uh, I would have some who needed to tell their stories write it. And they would tell some. But some of it they couldn't talk about. It was too horrible, too spiritually, too bad. Um, So I had to help some of the most horrendously abused children who are now adults and children working with children in child pornography. Okay, and just that go to a university, they don't get any of that. They don't work with the LGBTQ guys out on the streets and prostitutes. They don't work with them. Uh, they don't work in the brothels, you know, in other countries. They don't work with those children, those young girls. Don't work with them. Uh, they're kind of just stay in the. Um, certain culture they're in, uh, some cultures uh, in the black community, they really don't go to therapists. The men go to the barbers. The women go to their aunties. They don't go to therapy. In um Jewish community, they go to the, uh, the leaders. They don't talk much. The Islam, they don't talk. Buddhists, Confucius, FDLS, there is no therapy. Nobody talks. You just obey. And you get through it. And um, so it's interesting. Most of your people in prison, jails, have all been sexually, physically abused as children. That's just the way it is. And so if you know that and you are trying to help people heal, you don't have to ask them questions. You just look at them. They all got put... Multiple personalities, all been on drug and alcohol, all had horrible family lives, all been sexually, physically abused as children, and we got a mess. And a lot of therapists, that's what walks in your office. But they look a little different, you know, they might have a job and uh, have a family and go to church. And... um what do you do with the, the priests who use all these kids? And we're supposed to trust them. And you have to still help the priest. Why is he doing that? How do you help a child who's been so betrayed by God? They cannot help these children. Because you're dealing with spiritual issues plus the child abuse. And you don't get any of that in mental health counseling. So hopefully when somebody is seeking healing, they will ask questions of their therapist or their psychologist or their pastor and learn what their background is and what their certifications are in and what kind of volunteer work they have done in the community uh, so they can feel safe in their hands when they come in there and... um, and know that their therapist has got some knowledge. And um, 
has been educated in many different areas and um, that can help heal and the person to feel safe while they're getting healed. It's sort of like when you go to the hospital. You don't really, and if, if you show up in the emergency room, everybody in there is trained in emergency medicine. Now they have their specialties, and they always have the doctors we know on call. But when you get there, you feel safe. Uh, somebody that knows something that's trained, educated, stays calm, is going to help me. And that's one thing when people come to a therapist, they need to feel I'm safe with you. Uh, you know, I'm going to be okay in your office. There are rules. Uh, if you were a female, you probably shouldn't be seeing a man and telling your sexual abuse to. And if you're a man, you probably shouldn't, um, probably may not talk to a man. Men are, typically the perpetrators, and um, even though a lot of men are good healers, if you're dealing with children in the disassociative family system of a person, they are not going to rescue the man very well. But they need a mother that, um, that sort of comforts him, so... Annie, you want to give out your number or if you got anybody online or want to ask a question? Still callers. Um, number is 646-595-2118. Please give us a call to talk to Pastor Deborah or to talk to me. I don't have much to say, but you can talk to me if you want to. Back to you, Deborah. All right. Thank you, Miss Annie. So when somebody has had childhood abuse of any kind, they need to seek healing, no matter what age they are, even a teenager. And uh, they need to be knowledgeable enough of the therapist and who they're going to be able to ask some educated questions. And you can do some of your therapy online. Um, You know, there's teleministry phone. Um, some people never go that route. They just journal, and they get a lot of healing. And um, some people just kind of pray, and they get healed. And everybody is different. But if you're not seeking it, then nothing's really going to change. And it gets difficult. And... um The disassociative part of it fits on the uh, line, we'll call it a post-traumatic stress disorder. And it's all along that line. There's flashbacks. There's, they call it body memories. There's, you might get headaches, all the way to the disassociative identity disorder at the very end, we'll say. There's all kinds of tests that uh, neuropsychologists give. I used to give them. Um... And uh, they're looking for answers and patterns of answers and um, uh, that kind of thing. Of course, smart, uh, multiple personality people, they can answer the questions and they know what you're looking for. And they never look mentally crazy. And they're looking, um, they're discomforted, but they're trying not to get that label of being crazy, mentally ill, okay? And um, they're trying to be normal. There's a lot that goes on with people. And a, a one who is trying to heal them has to be well-educated. And um, in pastoral work, a lot of your men pastors are not very knowledgeable, not trained. And the female goes there. Not so much for healing, but it's like I want you to validate that something's happened. And I want you to help me to solve the problem. And most of the females, the wives of these pastors, they're not trained in it. 
so they can't even meet with the um, person who comes in. The youth pastors very rarely get this kind of training, even though they're working with children and teens and youth or college. And they just have, they just, they're not there, so. Um, And it's so divided now where, oh, the pastors, they're not trained, so they can't deal with, this is a medical issue, mental health issue, which is medical. They have to be referred to a psychologist or a licensed counselor. We pastors are not qualified. So the person doesn't get any therapy, um, prayer, a lot of Bible stuff, but sometimes that's not healing. What what do you do if your priest did this to you? Who do you go to? Okay, what Bill will tell you when he went to AA, he found the love of the men there. So he he'll tell you that you know it was love that started him healing. And um, so there's a lot of anger issues, maybe drug and alcohol issues, uh, boundary issues multiple personality issues, fear issues all the time, and um, lack of uh, believing people, trust issues, maybe eating disorders. And um, so it causes a lot of mess. And the the people deserve to have a well-qualified professional helping them. Or a, a, a good listening ear that doesn't judge them. Uh, and while somebody's getting healed, it's like sort of if you were in the hospital, you just had surgery or something, you don't need to be worried about the lawsuit. You don't need to be worried about revenge and uh, being an advocate. You just need to get healed and then recover and get strong. And sometimes that takes, uh, Annie might be able to tell you, it takes you years to get there. It so, does indeed. Uh, it, it took me a lot of years. But I remember how many, I am in a healed place. Do you know how many years you would say on the average for you, Annie? I started my healing journey when I retired from working, and that has been uh, almost 20 years. Okay. Do you and, know why you started it? I was like, I couldn't even talk. I couldn't talk about it. I, you know, in the beginning, I was completely shut down and totally full of anxiety, a real mess. What caused but you in, to start talking? Hmm, you know what it was? It was a phone meeting, uh, phone line that I helped to run and take care of. And I was mm-hmm. on that all day, every day for four years. And it, I was invisible. It was only the phone, you know what I mean? So that makes it safer. Mm-hmm. And um, I think that's, I think that really helped me. And the other thing is talking to people who know what I'm talking about, talking to other survivors. Mm-hmm. That's such a big difference from talking to people who aren't survivors who don't know what you've been through. Speak okay. The, the and reason the, the is, acceptance, you know, that I found, uh-huh. instead Let's of all my yourself hate, you know, I found people who uh-huh. could love me in spite of my past. Say well, that, I mean, I say that. that. Back then, I thought it was in spite of it. Well, listen to what you're saying. You got that from peers, but yes. not from a therapist. Not from a professional. No, but from I never peers. did get a real good therapist. I, mm-hmm. I didn't try that hard. I've only been through maybe four, but I've never mm-hmm. really. But you uh, won't found get that good... from the therapist because they are our legal obligations not to get close to you, not to hug right. you, not to be uh, show all that love because there's ethical reasons. And they can't, okay? So what you needed to start your healing and get it going, the mental health therapist could not provide to you, unethical. 
you know, you see it a lot in the doctors. They're distant. They're cold. They don't really just talk facts. Okay? They don't touch you. They don't hug you. Blah, blah, blah. They don't talk their stories. We get one every now and then that will listen to us. But therapists aren't there to do that. So that is a missing component in mental health therapy. Now, they believe they're helping you because they're in the office. They're trained. They want to help you. But they're under great rules of ethics of what they can do and what they can't do. And you found that I needed to be validated. I needed love. And Mm -hmm. you got that from the peer-to-peer group. And that mm-hmm. did it cost you any money to go to the peer to peer support group? No, um, it's it was basically a twelve step group supported by its own donations, which means that we would pass the hat around to pay the rent for the room. Okay, uh, but no, other than that, there is no cost. Okay, now the difference: see, therapy costs you money, insurance, cash, and it's a different. It's a very, I call it, cold environment, a very not like you're in the hospital. Uh, they, they're cold. They're educated, and they're analyzing what you're saying. Mm-hmm. But they, they really don't hug you. They really don't love you. They're really not, okay, if they never see you again, okay, but it doesn't really bother them. You're just a way to make money. Even though they're trying to help you, and they might be a PhD, okay, and, and yet they're going to charge money or the peer to peer and say, "I learned when when God asked me to put my license down, I go, what am I going to do? Because I'm going to teach you how to help people my way. I don't charge for anything I do. I don't monetize anything. I have no church, no ties, no nothing." It's all free. And it's different when love is the foundation. It's How can you afford to do it all for free? My husband worked. Okay. Oh, I see. Okay, great. Okay. Wow, that's wonderful that that's what you're doing. It was very, um, yeah, my life changed. Your financial status changed. I was making twenty, thirty thousand dollars a year. Gave it all up. You don't live the way you used to, and um, so there is difference, and the people know that. And like I said, certain cultures now, certain races, the black community does not go to counseling. The men go to the barbers. That's where they get theirs. The women go to the beauty shops. Mm-hmm. They don't go to regular therapists. They they just don't do that. And uh, a lot of your other religions, they're not going to go. And uh, they're going to follow their religious guidelines, and that's the way it's going to be. And uh, some family members, there there aren't any around. Okay? And so you you just do the best you can. And then other people got issues... um, what was it that, we'll just use that case that well, that guy was put in pr- prison out. It was a movie guy, Harry Weinstein or something. And mm-hmm. the girls wanted Harvey. to get movie, yeah, the girls wanted to get movie roles. Well, you got to go through him and with him sexually. Mm-hmm. Okay? So it happens, and yet you don't say anything. Okay? You don't talk about it. And, um... Then that case of, uh, he was just on the news tonight, Jeffrey Epstein. Why do all these powerful, we'll say men, want to go down to his private island with all these young girls? What's Mm. going on? They don't talk about it. When you're helping people, the men have problems. Okay? The girls have problems. Okay? The boys have problems. Okay? And uh, there's a lot of uh, abuse in the the homosexual community, gay, lesbian community, a lot of abuse. And so you have to be able to work with them, too. Children get abused. A lot of boys. 
a lot of boys get abused. And they come in the backside and they have to do other things. And a lot of therapists are not trained to deal with that. They only think in a female's sort of viewpoint. Because most of your therapists at the master's level are females. Your men, are you still there, Annie? I am. Okay. Most of your PhDs were typically men, and your psychiatrists were men. Most of your social workers, their philosophy was, we can help you heal if we change your social status, your education, your living experience, um, your clothes, uh, things like that. And um, where mental health and licensed professional counselors said you have a medical disease, it is biological, it is a medical illness, mental health. And we're under the psychiatrist, that's the pecking order. Pastors and the churches, they just did not get involved in it, still don't. And definitely, you know, they don't talk about it. They refer you out to somebody. And you're over there in the hands. And peer support's been around. AA's been around a long time. And um, and you don't hear much about it in mental health counseling or in the pastor's group. You hear Bible study. But you don't you hear grief support, but you don't hear peer to peer. So NASCA's right there out on the cutting edge of you know, the peer to the peer port. You know, they have that Zoom thing on there uh I think two or three times a week. And uh they're real good about that, supporting each other. And so healing is a journey, as you would say, Annie. It mm-hmm. is a goal worth going after. Is it possible to get there? Yes. The, are yes. the roads bumpy to get there? Yes. Will you remember some things you don't want to remember? Yes. Mm-hmm. Uh, and uh, is it pleasant? No. But the end results are what you're looking for. It's like if you broke your arm, you go to the hospital, you put a cast on it. Okay. And something's healing. Okay. Then you come out, your arm is weak, and you have to go and exercise it and get it strong again. So some people, they need knowledge. They need to forgive themselves, forgive others. They need information. Some people need legal, uh, you know, situations resolved. Some people need to write a book, need to tell their story, make a movie. Other people need to... Uh, get out there and say, this happened to me, but there's hope for you if you get healed and whatever path you want to choose. (laughs) And, um, but it's hard to be an advocate and be out there telling your story. Um, We'll use the medical community. We have what you call prevention people trying to tell you eat healthy, exercise, um, you know, get the stress out so you don't get the diseases. Then if you get the disease, you end up at the hospital. So you have to have trained people over there at the hospital level um, that can work with you. So you have two groups. They're both knowledgeable and they're both helping but from different perspectives. One's trying to prevent, and one's trying to heal. And so in advocacy work, uh, it is great if the preventers have knowledge. Like if you were trying to prevent prevent somebody getting diabetes, you would have knowledge of diabetes and sugar and how the body works, and you would learn healthy diets. But then if they get this, you know, tell them to get their checkups, okay? Uh, you are knowledgeable what the hospital offers in diabetes, uh, diabetes education classes and cooking classes and things like that. So you're knowledgeable, and so you have a group of people that are out there 
to stay on the front lines trying to advocate, advocate for prevention. And I'm sure it works, and a lot of people don't get it, and they're trying. Then you have the people who are the receivers, the therapists, the emergency room people, the child abuse people, the policemen, okay, and who are now, it's happened, and we have to, you know, bring, like, oh, you've got diabetes. Okay. Now we're going to have to get you serious. You're under a different person now. And uh, you're going to have to, you can't, it's here, sort of. And that's how, you know, NASCAR's trying to do both and trying to be do advocacy. And it does take training. They should get out there. But how are you going to advocate and try to talk to a Catholic priest if you're not Catholic? And in the in that particular religion, you ain't if you're just a regular parishioner, you can't say anything to the Catholic priest. The bishops they ain't gonna listen to you. They don't even listen to the Pope sometimes, you know. They do their own thing. And if you're a pastor and somebody comes and complains, they'll shut you down because they'll form they'll they'll close their wagons or they'll protect themselves. So a lot of times all you're left with, you can't advocate to people, can't fight the system, but you can get healed. And that's everybody's choice. And um, and it's a hard choice. Was it hard for you? Did you know about healing, Annie, when you were, were you seeking it? Did you know you needed it or what? Um, I I didn't know for a long time why I was sick. I was very sick when I had to retire from work, and I really believe it was it was the incest in my background that I pushed down. Well, I'd actually forgotten. I'd actually lost memory of it, and then when the memory came back, I realized, okay, that's what's making me so sick. Um, okay. Yeah, and but when I was working, I never took the time. I really couldn't have taken the time to go to therapy. I was too sick. I could barely work. <laughs> yeah, yeah. And people don't, you know, a lot of mental health counselors and pastors do not get training, education in how the mind and the body work together, and what causes right. the sickness, okay, how powerful thoughts are. Memories, what are memories, where are they stored, how the hormones and all of that dictates the body and the electrical stuff going through the body. And Mm -hmm. um, mental health counselors don't get any of that. And they don't understand uh, physiology, how the the biological body responds to thoughts. Okay, What can we do to change that? How, How can we... Get schools to change that so that they do teach about child abuse and, and all oh, of these if, Okay. If you have a university or a college in your town, you would go make an appointment with the dean of whether it's psychology, social work, mental health counseling, something, and sit down and talk hmm. with that dean of that school and say, you know, I'm an advocate of NASCA, of mental child abuse and stuff. Can I ask you some questions about what do you teach your students about child abuse? Now, remember, they're trying to learn. They're not learning advocacy there, okay? They are learning. They are being taught and trained to be a receiver, of somebody who's already done the child abuse. Hmm. Okay. So in the mental health world, you are like a doctor. I'm educated in an area. I'm waiting for my patient to come. That means something's already happened. I'm not out there trying to do advocacy or prevention. Okay. Most of your counselors are like your doctor's. In outpatient, they're waiting there for you to show up. There are some community organizations, uh, 
child uh, care places that do advocacy. They go around the community to different events and hand out. But you don't see them in churches. You don't see them in the women's groups, the youth groups. You don't see them in the pastoral meetings, the staff meetings. There's no training in the churches for advocacy. Okay. There's no notice to the choir, to the greeters, that if you suspect this, what you're supposed to do. There's no training on the 1-800 number if you suspect a neighbor. Okay. Now that's mm-hmm. done to the average citizens. Police know. Some pastors know. But they don't want to report it if it's especially one of their pastors. So... How you become an advocate, you would probably have to get on with an independent group. You'd have to be a good speaker, have a lot of knowledge. A lot of times you're just speaking to the choir. That's all. People that come to those Mm -hmm. things. Okay, they're already out there in some form helping people. Who would be the advocate? All right, school counselors, school teachers. They're already mandatory Reporters, if they suspect their ch- a child in there has had sexual abuse, they have to call the 1-800 abuse line. Mandatory report. That's not an advocate. Who's teaching parenting classes? To all parents. Mm-hmm. I used to do parenting classes for court-ordered parenting. Is that advocacy? No. It's already happened. Mm-hmm. Who's teaching parenting to all these young girls who are have no father, live in the ghettos, the gang. Who's teaching them? Where are the books, the free books to them? There's there's free uh, books, okay? So you have to sit and you have to strategize. You have to understand advocacy versus being a receiver, okay? The colleges are to train receivers, therapists. I sit in my office, mm-hmm. wait for somebody to come in. The deed's already done. I'm called in by the police. It's already happened. I'm a receiver. Okay. Who were the parents? When did they did they get anything in high school? Did they get anything in church? Were there any handouts of child development? Was there any marriage classes taught, child development classes taught in high school? Girls start getting pregnant as soon as they get have their periods. And many girls go, hey, as soon as I get pregnant, the money starts rolling in from the federal government. The boy starts giving me money. My grandma and auntie and stuff, hey, they're all happy. They got a grandchild. Culture. Mm. Uh-huh. So... It is different. It takes it's different personalities. It's different stuff. I um, you can do a lot of it. I do a lot of it on YouTube Shorts. You ask people questions, okay? But most mm-hmm. you aren't going to get there in the advocacy. The sheriffs already know about it. The judges know about it. Social work. Everybody knows about it. It's already been going on. Going on. Got one eight hundred abuse lines already happening. Okay, but the, is there such the, a thing a one eight hundred abuse line here in Florida? There is. Oh yeah. You suspect child abuse. Every mature adult over the age of eighteen is a mandatory reporter to the one eight hundred abuse line in the state of Florida. If you suspect, and is that the phone them, number? A B U S E. Uh, 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 could be. But we're a mandatory report, doesn't matter who you are. If you suspect it, you call. You're anonymous. I've done it. Mm-hmm. Okay? It's wonderful. Now, that's not advocacy. That's reporting. Advocacy yeah. would be somebody needs some parenting here, and they need yeah. some knowledge about how to control their anger. And what happened? This is generational. And, yeah. Annie, we've got about five minutes left. It's yeah, twenty five. So there is a difference, and NASCA needs to teach that. There can be classes. 
you know, and peer to peer to peer. They could have a NASCAR peer support training and advocacy training, uh, you know, things like that. And they could train you to be an advocate and you get a certification from NASCAR as an advocate and you could get one as a peer support, you know, from NASCAR. There will be some classes you do it on YouTube or online and stuff and you get a certification. Mm -hmm. I will let you close it out. We have four minutes. Okay. Okay. I'm going to tell you a dream I have about child, um, I mean, parenting, parenting education. Maybe I'll even do this someday. I wish that there were little 30-second free videos that just show up on Facebook and show up on Google, and they're just parenting. 30 seconds on, this, this is a good idea for parenting, and it's just free and out there for everyone. Um, what you can do is YouTube now has YouTube Shorts, which is kind of trying to compete with TikTok. 60 seconds. You do it on your phone. Yeah. You do it on your computer. You put it on the YouTube channel, and you, you premiere it every day. And it's 60 seconds. And Bill could do it. Anybody can do it. And um, huh. if you get on YouTube short, it is it's fast. It's quick. You just you keep the... Uh, the stuff out there, you keep it before the people. I get some that get 200 views in 60 seconds. It's all over the world. you got to wow. remember that, you too. It's all free. And you can do it right there with your iPhone. I use a, a camera. So, all right, it's 827. You close this out and do whatever you need to do. Okay, well, thank you so much, Pastor Deborah. And I am going to call you for one of these mornings and pick your brain. Because you have so many good ideas. I hope you don't mind. No, um, no, no. I will wrap up the <laughs> I'll wrap up the show now. This has been Stop Child Abuse Now Scan Radio Show Number Three Two One Two. All of our shows are archived as soon as they're done. They go on the website and you can listen to them again at any time. There are 3,212 of them. And we've got 90 seconds left. Um, I just want to say that this has been NASCA, the National Association for Adults, Survivors, sorry, of Child Abuse. NASCA.org. N-A-A-S-C-A dot org. And now I'm going to play the going out music. Thanks, everyone, for listening tonight. Thank you, Pastor Deborah. You're welcome. And this has been Annie Marjorie, your co-host for tonight. Here we go with the going out music. Another tomorrow, because that's gone away.